Good morning, audience. Hang in there and we'll, um, we're still admitting people, so just give us a minute or two. Good morning, everyone. This is Charles McClintock. Um, nice to see you all. And uh, thanks for joining us on this Friday morning or Friday afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I am very excited about our presentations this morning. They are uh, high quality, wonderful, diverse uh, presentations. And I'll say a little something about each one before we get started. Um, one of our presenters, Jennifer Hurley, took ill and cannot be with us this morning, so we will have three presentations, and um, we may end up, uh, we may end a little bit early as a result. Uh, we had a great seminar in uh, January. Uh, some of you, I think, were present, and um, it was our first face-to-face -face event uh, in several years, as you well know, and um, this is, uh, uh, we had so many people who wanted to present, we didn't have enough room for them on the January program. So um, here we have a, a virtual presentation and um, hear from even more of our fellows. Since we have an extra few minutes, I wonder if I could go down the list. You could just unmute yourself and say hello and just where you are physically located this morning. So I will start to model the process. Um, Charles McClintock, Santa Barbara, California. Catherine Cott, would you go next? Yes, Catherine Cott, Oakland, California. Carol. Carol Castle, Harmony, Florida. Leslie. Leslie Hamdorf, the United States Virgin Islands. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's great. Elena if you're there. I'm here, hello, Elena Nicholson, Santa Barbara, California, Fielding Headquarters. Fielding Headquarters, Headquarters Central. Lisa Buckley. Hi, Lisa Buckley, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Sylvie. Sylvie Plant, Ottawa, Canada. Where in Canada? Ottawa, the capital. Ottawa, Ottawa. okay. Ziva, one of our longest uh, ISI, longest member of the ISI Fellows Program. The Condesser, Orchard Lake, Michigan. Jeff. Jeff Schneider, San Diego, California, Planet Earth. Dennis. Can you hear me, Dennis? We can see you with your head down, but anyway, we'll come back to you. Uh, Kathleen Curran. Hi, Kathleen Curran. I'm in Houston, Texas. Kaylin. Kaylin Staten, I'm in West Virginia. And your position at Fielding is? Associate Director of Communications. We're, we're lucky to have you. You're doing a wonderful job. Well, thank David. you. I'm happy to be here today. Great. David. I'm David Saylor, and I'm in Montclair, New Jersey. Daria. Unmute. Hi, I'm Dory Bardell from Bellevue, Washington, right across the lake from Seattle. Great. Tracy. Tracy Long from Ventura, California. And Dennis Ger German. Can you? Dennis German. German, sorry. Well, I don't blame you. Everybody messes it up and calls Deutschlanders. German, so I understand that, and I'm Norwegian, but uh, yeah, Dennis German, uh, Bonnie Lake, not too far from Seattle. Thank you. Barbara. Barbara Volger, Tampa, Florida. Great. Christy. You want to unmute? Uh, Christy Harrison on mute in Houston, Texas. 
Carla. Carla Van Havel, Reno, Nevada. Aiden, and Aiden is also our uh, Kipnis Award winner for the year. Aiden. Hey, uh, Aiden Hirschfield from gloomy Portland, Oregon. <laughs> nice to see everybody. Caroline. Caroline Wetterburn. I'm in Santa Barbara, California. Kim. Kim Cantor Gianni, Evergreen, Colorado. Uh, Brian. Uh, Brian Wallen from uh, Santa Clarita, California. Ah, great. Lisa. Lisa Revere from San Francisco Bay, California. Tiffany. Tiffany Dillard from Peoria, Arizona, outside of Phoenix. And who? <clears throat> let me just say, if I've missed anybody, oh, Megan. Hi, this is Megan Brubaker. I'm from Cupertino, California. Uh, Tim. Hello, Tim Yamasaki from Salvain, California. Shannon. Hi, Shannon Byer from Los Angeles, California. Marjorie with a wonderful smile. Hi, I'm Marjorie Florisil. I'm in beautiful Playa del Carmen, Mexico. Whoa, interesting. Um, Brian, want to say hello, Brian, and tell us where you are? He may be still logging, getting fully logged in. Okay, who have I missed? Is there anybody who has not said hello? If so, unmute yourself and say hello. Amazing. All right. Well, again, thank you all for both being ISI fellows and for being here uh, today to uh, listen to your colleagues reporting. You know, one of the great things um, about fielding is how uh, it really does reinforce uh, the desire for lifelong learning and lifelong inquiry and uh, professional practice and our alumni and our ISI fellows in particular really exemplify that. So we have three terrific presentations. I love them because they are, for a couple reasons, but both they, um, they really represent the idea that uh, getting, your, getting your degree at fielding really meant something to you. You, you have a habit of mind now that naturally mixes theory and evidence. And uh, both, all three presentations uh, represent this, uh, this kind of wonderful mixture, especially the theory part, which is um, really heartening to see. So um, again, we're gonna go in the order of Carol Castle, Catherine Cott, and then Leslie Hamdorf. Uh, each of them has about 25 to 30 minutes to make, make a presentation. Uh, including questions and uh, from from you all and comments, and they will each decide uh, um, if they want to have questions during their presentation or if they want you to hold your questions until the end. So each of you, each of the presenters, please let us know what your preference is in that regard. Um, so I think Carol, uh, if you're geared up and ready to go, uh, you should have the screen sharing capability and we'll look at your presentation. Great, thank you. Let's see, share screen, here we go. I will get us into presentation mode. There we go, are we good? We're good. Okay. And, uh, we're gonna learn about horse wisdom and building resilience things that we didn't know about before. So welcome to my presentation, everyone. Charles, thank you for the opportunity to present on what I've been working on for years. Um, First Nature Foundation is my nonprofit that I founded in 2018. Um, and it took several years to build the facility, but uh, unfortunately, July 2020, when it was ready, was exactly when COVID really went into overdrive. So it was really only um, late 2021 that we started offering programs. And even then, COVID, you know, was 
wreaking havoc with our schedule. A lot of people really weren't getting out there yet. Um, we're education-based and the focus that we, um, uh, and, I, and I'll talk a little more in detail about this later, the focus for the nonprofit is soft skills leadership development. And we do it with different audiences, which you'll learn about later. Um, because I have a little time, I'll just preface this by saying, oh, and by the way, if you have questions, um, I can't see um, you guys because I'm in screen sharing mode, so I can't tell if you have questions or not. So let's wait until um, uh, I'm done with the presentation and then you can ask whatever questions you like. Um, so just a quick um, reason for my starting this. When I attended fielding, um, my first area of study was I wanted to look at how an interaction with nature and animals might enhance human potential in some way. And after about a year doing that, I segued to, you know, I, I thought, well, with that and, you know, $4, I could get a coffee, you know, what, who's going to want anything like that? So I started focusing on um, uh, corporations and how um, a social orientation might influence, of, of the CEO might influence how the organization's sustainability practices might operate. Um, so I completed my doctorate. I turned my doctorate into a book. I published articles in peer-reviewed journals. I um, was the senior editor on an edited book that got published by Routledge, all of that. Um, was teaching at, at Fielding um, in the uh, OMD program, master's program. But um, my dream really was to kind of go back and work with animals and nature in helping people reconnect with the best part of themselves. And I, um, I just found myself back there. Um, I had horses since 2004. And when I moved here to Harmony, and uh, in 2000. Uh, 18, we were forced to move our horses to somewhere else. And the developer in my community offered a particular parcel of land to me. So the whole idea was moving my horses, but now I had this 27 acre parcel of land and I could really do this program that um, involved helping people um, source their, their inner wisdom and their best leadership skills toward the service of not only themselves, but their communities, their workplaces, et cetera. So um, uh, I, I had to build the facility because it was just a cattle pasture. It was, um, it had barbed wire along the road. It um, had no other fencing. There was no electricity, no water, no structures, nothing when I bought the property in August of 2018. So all these photographs you see here, all of this was done since 2018. So you'll see that our little sign by the road and then on the left, and then you'll see our barn that was built and that's where our classroom is. The picture on the upper right, that's the interior of the classroom where we have our nice air conditioned space where we can do our classroom segment of the programming. And uh, in the middle, you'll see our covered arena. In Florida, it's really important to have shade and also have shelter from thunderstorms. So that's why we built that. Bottom left is our shed where we um, typically start with our programs. The first um, exercise in any of our programs, whether it's Horse Wisdom for Heroes or Horse Play for Leaders, um, we start with them under the shed where the horses are in their stalls. And then you'll see uh, community outreach in the middle bottom. That's 4-H, uh, 4-H group that we open our facility to for them to have programming, as well as other organizations, uh, the local extension service and some other, you know, a number of other different um, organizations we allow to use our facility pretty much free of charge. And then you'll see on the bottom right, some of my horses, Cody, Dakota, and Goldie. So what we're about, yeah, so different audiences, it could be kids, teens, adults, seniors, it's about greater self-awareness and emotional intelligence, relational skills, at work, at home, anywhere. We are actually just tomorrow starting with writing lessons, but the purpose of the writing lessons is to 
um, not just see the horse as an instrument for somebody's um, fun or, or um, competition. It's more about how can you partner with the horse so that the two of you together and you in particular can source your best leadership skills to have a great outcome for you and the horse and then translate that in the lesson um, more intentionally into life in general, whether what in whatever uh, area of life, whether it's for kids or adults. So um, in leadership positions and different organizations, we work with nonprofits, for profits um, to help them in um, essentially communication skills, emotional intelligence, use intelligence using conflict productively, um, and team building. So those are some of the um, uh, areas of skill development that we focus on. And um, in terms of ISI, what I'm doing, this photograph that you see is um, the most recent cohort of our Horse Wisdom for Heroes. Those are all the men in the back. They're mostly veterans. Um, they all have some form of PTSD. Most of them have drug and alcohol abuse problems. Most of them are homeless. Uh, they have mental and health um, um, uh, sorry, mental health and uh, behavioral issues as well sometimes. So we, um, and, and at the bottom, you'll see um, uh, me in the center, my uh, collaborator on the left, and then we have on the right are two horse care professionals and a volunteer on the left. So we, um, and, and I'll um, go into more detail with what we do about with, uh, in, in order to, um, evaluate whether we're having a positive effect or not. So some of our programs, the first program I started is Parents and Spouses of Suicide. It was started in 2021, early 2021. Um, um, my husband took his life in 2020. And um, of course, that was COVID time. And I thought, what can I do with this strategy to make it to make some kind of contribution. So uh, PASO still goes, it's uh, every, it's the first and third Wednesday of every month. It's virtual. We have people from around the country. We've had people from Canada as well. Um, and it's really just a support group for people who've lost a, a partner or a child to suicide. We have Leading for Change for Teens, which we um, unfortunately have yet to deliver. We've been, our programs are not open enrollment. We work with institutions for them to send us cohorts of participants for our programs. And their only obligation is to provide transportation if necessary to and from the facility, as well as a mental health professional who is experienced, educated, certified, and knowledgeable about these particular participants. Um, we've had trouble um, getting buy-in. Uh, a lot of the um, foster care system here in Florida has gone through a lot of changes in the last year, and uh, it seems like a lot of the staffing is very overwhelmed, overworked, and just doesn't have the bandwidth, but we're still working on it. Horseplay for leaders for um, uh, people in organizations, um, as I mentioned before, communication, emotional intelligence, conflict, team building, and then our Horse Wisdom for Heroes, uh, to build self-leadership and resilience. So we have a theory of change. Um, it, it's really a shift. These, these are all shifts, these bullet points from self or in-group, you know, for me or just our small us group to a larger version of we, from making assumptions and interpretations and thereby judgments toward curiosity and inquiry, uh, from uh, competition to collaboration, from a weakness orientation to a strengths and potential orientation, uh, from nature and people as instruments to something more, much more than that, uh, from just money to a thriving environment, healthy people is equally important, and from the short term to the long term in terms of decision making, from either or to both and and many right ways, from linear to complex and interdependency. And finally, from avoiding conflict to conflict as a potential for positive change. So those are that's our theory of change. And it happens through these programs where people are getting a, a, a number of tools as well as experiences to give them some, something to take home as well as the experience at the ranch. And we uh, focus on what is the, um, 
what are they going to practice? What are they going to experiment with between this session and the next time we're in touch? So uh, in the Horse Wisdom for Heroes, we have two assessments. Um, one is called the Perceived Stress Scale, which is a, a well-recognized instrument. And the other is an instrument that I created called the Resilience Assessment. I have not yet, and if anybody wants to help me here, um, I have not yet um, tested the resilience assessment for validity and reliability. Um, so would love help with that. Uh, we had our third cohort uh, finish in December. And um, according to the assessments at the beginning, at the end, we had a 24% reduction in the perceived stress and a 27% increase in resilience. And if anybody wants to see those uh, instruments, I'm very happy to share them. Um, so with that, I am going to stop my share for now and see if there are any questions. Thank you. How about a hand so far? Thank you. Did I go too fast? Was it good timing? I'm sorry. Did so, I go too fast? Was it good timing? Oh, yeah. No, you left yourself plenty of time. Good. Um, yeah, so the floor is open for questions and comments. I'll start. Um, how do you recruit people to participate? Um, so uh, a variety of things, uh, networking, local chambers of commerce, uh, going to people who are within organizations that might be potential um, providers or participants, um, uh, social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, um, and uh, working with people who may be potential collaborators to, pro to provide other programs uh, for different audiences. So uh, a real combination. I, I won't, um, um, I'll share that it's been kind of a struggle. To, you know, this is not something that's really easy to understand, I think, for a lot of people. So it's it's been um, time consuming and um, uh, requ has required a lot of effort to even get people to um, want to buy in to a, a program that's essentially free for their people. The corporate programs cost, but the programs for veterans, for girls in the foster care system, for other um, underserved and more marginalized communities, it's, it's been a bit harder. And I think it's just that people are kind of overwhelmed. People, staff members in those organizations are kind of overwhelmed. Thanks, Charles. Yeah, and um, have you had any corporate? Uh... Yes, I've had a number of corporate folks. I've had a local uh, workforce um, com uh, organization uh, come a number of times. I've had a Marriott Vacations Worldwide. I've had uh, a, an office of Northwestern Mutual. So I've had a number of different, I've had folks from Disney. So I've had a number of different um, uh, corporate clients, but it's a, it's a, um, it's a long sales cycle. Uh, yeah, but that's promising, it seems. Thank you. And, and, I see um, Marjorie has her hand up. Okay, Marjorie, go. Thanks so much. What a really interesting um, presentation. It dovetails really nicely with my own work, which is on trauma and resilience. And so one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is in your assessment, I thought you reduced down the benefits to the, um, the minimal stress reduction. And so I'm wondering as you're working through all of that, are you starting to capture some of the ineffable um, kinds of wins, um, particularly if you're working with PTSD survivors, um, there are things other that their psychological health other than mere stress reduction and how or if you're capturing that. Thank you, Marjorie. So these programs are about an hour and a half long every other week for six weeks. We have had um, increasing through the cohorts turnover in the programs. People drop out of the, uh, so we work at the transition house, people drop out of their programs. Um, people are expelled from their programs. People start our, our program only to drop out for whatever reason, even though they're still at the transition house. So, and it's hard to know, honestly, how much of what we're doing is the cause of the reduction in stress 
and the increase in resilience. Um, and we're we're understaffed, right? So we don't we're not um, we're not going to interview these people except I have, my promotional director does. So she gathers some information which we get permission from the veterans to post about their journeys and how the program has helped them, but it hasn't been analyzed. And so I am certainly looking for folks uh, to help me with data collection, analysis, um, and publication. Thanks for the question, Marjorie. Yeah, thanks, Marjorie. Other questions? Lisa's Here. hand is up. Thanks. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Good question. On I, I saw it with the uh, the theories for your programs. Are you also connecting to social emotional learning? That's that's one of the core theories that um worked with on the dissertation as well. I, I see a lot of connections there. Yes. Yeah, so, um, in terms of emotional intelligence, social emotional learning, where um, we would love, you know, I've even approached uh, some of the counselors in the local. Um, high schools to see if they want to send kids for social emotional learning. Uh, I haven't really collected any data because I, I haven't gotten enough buy-in to run programs for that. It's a long process. And, um, you know, if you have any suggestions, I'd love to hear them for um, persuading them to send a cohort of kids. That's not going to cost them any money or the kids for that matter. But um, yeah, it's, um, I would love to collect more data that can be analyzed. And um, we're not there yet. Yeah, that sounds great. And I uh, would love to connect our resources for the um, Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, anybody else, please speak up. I have a question. Dory. Um, so you collect the data, the interviews, I'm assuming. Um, but is there an overall framework for the research itself, a design that you are holding in mind while you do the research to lead you to have certain patterns that emerge? So um, I am waiting for, because I can't do it all by myself, Dory. I am, you know, managing the facility, taking care of the horses administering the nonprofit, doing the bookkeeping, developing the programs. So I am looking for people to, um, from a more academic perspective, to help develop a wider, uh, more um, robust framework for collecting, for, you know, for the research and for collecting and analyzing data and publishing it. Thanks for asking. And if you're interested, please contact me. <laughs> well, it would be it would be great if we had um, a student whose dissertation dovetailed with this concept. Um, yes, I know, and I and I will just say parenthetically that Carol is one of our generous donors who created a student scholarship uh, in sustainability, for, um, and so we're very grateful for that. But uh, maybe there'd be a way. I'm not sure. Um, but well, let's keep that in mind, Carol, and, and maybe we can figure. Find find some something there. I want to say thank you to uh, Aiden for his um, kind uh, uh, words on chat, and Kathleen as well. And thank you to Lisa for um, the uh, resource. And then Christy, so interesting what you were doing. Wonder if you have connect uh, consider connecting. Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Boys and Girls Clubs. Yeah, there, actually, there's a brand new Boys and Girls Club that um, I had hoped to go to a meeting yesterday. I wasn't able to get to, but um, trying to connect with them and um, and the Girl Scouts. We don't have any YMCA anywhere local to here, but um, thank you so much for those suggestions. We are we are going in that direction. Great. Any uh, final comments or questions? Ziva's got a question. Ah, go Ziva. Thank you for what you're doing. And offline, I have a connection to make with for you. But I was wondering how you're funding this. Um, looking for grants, 
donors, sponsors. So for example, we got a, we got a community grant from the county for our first cohort of uh, veterans. We also got a sponsor and we, that sponsor has been approached again for another uh, sponsorship this year to help support the veterans program. Um, so uh, donors looking for donors, sponsors, board members, et cetera, uh, to help fund as well as grants. Thank you for asking, Steve. But yeah, and um, the building of the facility was is all my money, right? And uh, uh, when you have a nonprofit, the IRS requires you to, if you're a public charity, requires you to do a calculation every year for public support and donate so much to my nonprofit every year. And Leslie says, it might be interesting to train some of the older students at the organization in the action research model. Yeah, they can do some data collection. Yeah. And wounded warriors may be interested. Yes, I've already considered. Thank you so much, Christy. It's probably time, Charles, to move on to our next presenter, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thank you again. I want to say that if you want to chat sometime about uh, validity and re reliability for your instrument, I'd be happy to just chat with you and consult with you about that. Thank you, Charles. Much when appreciated. You, when you're ready. <laughs> All right, uh, a round of applause for a wonderful presentation from Carol. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, when our next presenter um, applied to be an ISI fellow, uh, she had a line of inquiry around Bowen theory, and I knew nothing about that and have learned a little bit about it since then. But uh, let's turn to Catherine Cott, who is going to tell us about Bowen theory and also her journey, her journey of pub trying to get some something published on, on this, on her research on Bowen. Catherine, it's all up to you and you can share your screen anytime. Great, Charles. Thank you so much. So let's uh, try this. I've actually shifted things around a little bit since we did our test. So I'm hoping that uh, my, sl my slides still uh, still work. Let me know if you're seeing what you think you should be seeing. Yep, we can see it from slide number two. Yep. From slide number two. Okay, play from start. Yeah. And uh, great. Um, so are you seeing my slides, but not my notes? We well, see a little bit of notes because you're not in the presentation mode. Well, uh, this was the problem I had when we tested, but. Um, let me get out and get in again, if that's okay. Sorry for the difficulty here. Yeah, sometimes you have to close the file completely, then open and then share. That's what I'll do. Sorry for the, for the hassle. Charles, <clears throat> I'm um, in a in an awkward place here. Perhaps you should go ahead with the third presenter. And I think I need to come out of Zoom and back in again because I'm not even I'm not even seeing you all at this point. So okay. um, can we switch around and I'll I'll be back. Leslie, does that work for you? Okay. Yes, absolutely. I get it. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that's that. A, that's all right. Uh, so, uh, Leslie, uh, you're ready to go? 
I think so. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, well, we're going to learn a lot about a, a adolescent development and action research and action leadership. <laughs> All right, it's new, it's burgeoning. Like, <laughs> all right. Um, thank you guys. Thank you for joining today. I'm excited to share my research as well as introduce a new development theory for adolescents that I feel like is my life's work. It started um probably 20 years ago, actually, when I came to St. Croix, and it has evolved since due to my work with fielding as well as my ongoing work in education. So I can't wait to have discussion at the end, to be totally honest. Um so a couple of objectives here today are, um, I wanna give some background about the adolescent development theories that helped guide the adolescent development theory of action leadership, and then share the five principles of action leadership for adolescents. And then I'll present my research that I conducted last year at the school where I was working and then wrap up with some next steps. So that's kind of where we're going in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so this slide represents the history of adolescent development theories that I feel like led me to where I am with that with Allah is what I call it, action leadership for adolescents. Um, so over 100 years ago, you guys might know, Stanley Hall came up with a deficit mindset theory that was mostly known as storm and stress, that the time period of adolescent development was um, stressful and they were seen as vessels to be filled rather than people to be cultivated. Um, his work included research with adolescents and he was identified as this storm and stress time period. And this model was dominant for almost a century, um, even though there were other presentations and other evidence that proved um, that proved that adolescents weren't necessarily just vessels to be filled. I wanna pay tribute here to John Dewey, um, simply not necessarily because he was able to take center stage with the adolescent development and or education, but I think his experimentalism and his instrumentalism actually informed my approach and what I do with adolescents and education and, um, and the theories that I that support um, what works for me in classrooms and when I'm working with adolescents. And he believed that education was not just a process of living, um, or I'm sorry, he believed it was a process of living and not a preparation for the future. So again, we wanted to live with the adolescents. We wanted to understand what they were also going to bring to the table. And they weren't just tokens to be sitting at the table or adornments or ornaments to be in society or, or for that matter, to take care of people in the future. Um, fast forward to the late 1900s when we had Richard Lerner and some of his contemporaries, they capitalized on evidence from the mid century that showed that the adolescent development models of Stanley Hall and others were inconsistent and they claimed and they wanted to move forward with that. And so we had Richard Lerner who offered a new strengths based approach, which if you imagine storm and stress on this continuum, um, you have storm and stress on one side and then you have strengths based on the opposite side. So this is where they developed the positive youth development model. And in short, this states that effective youth engagement is not just about fixing behavior problems, it's about building and nurturing all the beliefs, behaviors, knowledge, attributes, and skills that adolescents are going to need to have a successful life in a, a productive adolescence and into adulthood. Um, this also supports the five C's framework that a lot of mentorship models use, and it cultivates this whole system, the entire system of support. Another framework right here at the end of the slide that I wanna pay tribute to as well is Carol Dweck's growth mindset. I think this gives um, support for how I moved from positive youth development and this growth mindset approach actually gave some actionable items into like how we can make the positive youth development model come alive in the classroom and in other out of school time activities for adolescents. Um, I call attention to all of these because they have in some way shaped my action leadership approach for adolescents. At this point, though, I want to pause and you'll notice that I have positive youth development, growth mindset, and then I also have transformational leadership. This came about quite a bit when I was doing my thesis with fielding a couple years, almost a decade ago. Um, and I, this is important to me because in my work with adolescents, I still felt like we were trying to um, 
having them be tokens at the table and not necessarily helping them become the leaders that we actually need them to be because they're inheriting the issues we've created. And so issues the future generator, the, the older generations have created are going to need to be solved with new mindsets and new approaches. And if they're not taught and trained to be transformational leaders, then we might get stuck in this transactional approach, which in my opinion and my experience isn't necessarily what we're looking for. And so I pause here to kind of let us know that this is the this is the piece where the leadership ideas come into play along with acknowledging the psychological development of an adolescent. So um, I think that's, that's part of the reason why I'm including that. And too often engagement between the leaders and subordinates, teachers, students, parents, and children can become transactional. However, if we take Bass's theory of transformational leadership, where leaders shift relationships and cultures to move those they are serving, out of that self-interest mode and into awakening their awareness of the greater good, so then we can shift some of our social ills as well as some of this um, self-motivated change and self-motivated action. Um, so the goal of this is to apply this model as adolescents are developing. And I believe we would have an entirely different generation of civic actors and change agents. So, I'm going to have you guys look at this diagram, and if you're out and about in your house or wherever you are doing something, I want you actually to imagine a stick figure in your brain, because that is the image of Allah, essentially. Um, with this background in mind, now I want us to think and lean into this action leadership for adolescents. It's a multifaceted model that takes the PYD growth mindset and transformational leadership a step further by leveraging the growth and integration of the five principles listed here. So these five principles, if you can imagine that stick figure in your head, if you're not looking at the screen, are brain balance at the top where the head is. And then on the two hands, you have skill development and then also interdisciplinary collaboration. And the feet where we have, where we're grounded into our place, into our earth, you have innate wisdom and cultural responsibility. I share this with you and I want you guys to imagine this and kind of live into this because this physiological placement of these principles, I feel like is just as important as me discussing and explaining them to you. So I really want you guys to have that image in your mind as I'm talking about these different principles. So now we'll take a look at the different explanations of the principles. Let's begin with the principle of brain balance up at the top. Um, this principle ensures that there is space in the learning process for full integration of a lesson or a skill. Because full integration requires movement and cognitive reasoning, incorporating this principle into lessons for adolescents is invaluable. Furthermore, creating space for these organically lived lessons continues to feed the developmental new neural pathways for adolescents. Many of us that are studying adolescents know that the regions of their brain are just developing at this time and they're just connecting and they're not fully developed. Um, and so when we create those new neural pathways with these novel experiences in this malleable brain, we can then form these new pathways that are going to help them become transformational leaders, action leaders, change agents that are going to help steward our society. I think we lost your audio, Leslie. Is Leslie still with us? Um, Seems like know. she had a network freeze. Yeah, her slide is frozen. Video is frozen. Okay, Leslie, you're you're frozen, <laughs> so to speak. I think she just logged off. Maybe or she, she she might have lost her connection. No, okay. here she's back. Okay. There you are. You're on mute, Leslie. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks. Um, did we? Did you guys hear me talk about skill development? Awesome. Thanks, Carol. You're. I can only see you, Carol. So keep guiding me, okay? <laughs> um, so on the opposite side of skill development, we have wait, 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 wait. Oh, we lost sorry. your slides. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Thank you all. <laughs> we good. There we go. Okay, thank you guys. 
Um, on, I'm not, I don't think I don't think I heard you on skill development. Okay, so skill development just emphasizes this explicit instruction of the set identified skill um, and cultivates the cycle of learning where we have explicit instruction, the modeling is happening, then the learner gets to practice it, you have a reflection of growth, and then hopefully in that cycle at some point mastery comes of the said skill. On the opposite side of skill development, then we have interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, this principle I defined as the cultivation of intentional connections across arenas. This creates the space for development and it embodies the notion that involving more people and ideas will take time. However, the end product will be of higher quality and also create model ex novel experiences, again, that are feeding that um, adolescent developing brain. And let's see if I can. There we go. Okay. And then we're going to move down to the feet where these are, these are what I feel like are the two most important principles of ALA, although very difficult. I feel like they're still in the developing phases, I feel like of explaining them. And I think they're probably the least um, addressed in educational settings for adolescents at this point. So we have innate wisdom on the bottom and innate wisdom on one foot, and that represents one's inst instinctual knowledge and intelligence. It also taps into one's self-awareness of how his or her values do or do not align with another's, another peer, another classmate, another teacher, a, an adult in their life. And they're able to access and use one, one's innate wisdom. Is, the accessibility of it is imperative to one's own growth and autonomy as a leader and again as a civic steward. If we can't tap into our own voice and we can't be proud of that, then we aren't, then we're going to be hushed and shunned possibly and not be in that vulnerable space ongoing into, into the future. And then finally, counterbalancing that innate wisdom is cultural responsibility. The combination of self-reflection and self-realization kind of tying back to that transformational leadership idea of moving away from how is this going to serve me into how is this going to serve me, including everybody else around me. And it answers questions like how do my actions impact others? And if they are negative, whose responsibility is it to adjust course? Um, I believe cultural responsibility embodies the notion that cultural humility and competency are fluid and changing with social needs, but this can be done in a way and in a flow that adolescents embody that cultural responsibility and come to that realization on their own. So those are the five principles of action leadership for adolescents. And now you guys can probably see that that stick figure idea a little bit better and how even when we're walking or when we're engaged in like in our physical being, we still need that balance. So let's get into the research. I conducted the research at a charter school in Denver, Colorado last school year. So it was for all intents and purposes post COVID a pretty traditional year. We were all back in person just wearing masks for half half of the year even. Um, so we weren't split into cohorts and there was no virtual learning at this point. Um, the top two boxes represent the demographics of the seniors in high school that were a part of the study. And I had 76 out of 102 seniors opt into the research, um, the research project. And the research was conducted in a year long course called Civics in Action that I was the teacher of. And it was a combination of experiential project based learning and traditional civics curriculum um, for three trimesters. So we were on a trimester program at that school. Um, the bottom box are my research questions. I'm only going to talk about the results to three of the five questions um, today during our presentation. So let's get into it. Um, the quantitative results were found using a self-authored tool, an instrument tool, which Charles, I'd love to love to talk to you about the validity and reliability of that tool. Um, and I called that the self-reflection empowerment inventory. And it was a survey with both qualitative and quantitative information where students did a self-reflection of the of seven 21st century skills that I, those were the skills that I wanted to teach. And then I overlaid that with using the principles of Allah to have the students access the skills and to demonstrate growth in those skills. Um, 
the skills, if you guys want to know, were communication, civic virtue, critical thinking, self-direction, collaboration, invention, and information literacy. So let's talk a little bit about my findings. Um, the first question I'll talk about is where did students demonstrate the most significant gains as measured by the SREI? The exciting thing for me this year when I finally got to dig into the data after I had collected it all was that in all quantitative areas of the SREI, the mode score increased between the pre and post survey distribution. So this graph here demonstrates that growth. I'm not going to talk about all seven different categories, but I am going to highlight some of those more specific ones. Um, specifically communication, which is if can you guys see my mouse? It's the second piece right here. Um, the mode score for the pre-survey was seven. So it's this blue line right here. It was seven. And then for the post-survey, it bumped up to 10 with 32% more participants selecting 10 on the post-survey. Another data point to look at for this question was invention, which I can't see it because my fate, like my screen is there, but you, hopefully you guys can see it. Um, the growth of the mode score only increased by two points from a six to an eight, but the number of respondents selecting eight on the post survey was 38%. So the growth didn't make it necessarily to 10, but more participants actually demonstrated that they felt like they had that growth. Um, and then similar was critical thinking. While the mode remained the same, right here, you guys can see that line, uh, remained the same as the number eight, the number of responses for the post survey increased from 26% to 48%. So again, really significant growth in those three specific areas, which was pretty exciting. Um, question number two that I'll pull up was, what experiences noted in the narrative portion of the SREI have a direct relationship with exercises, activities, or lessons as documented in the civics and action curriculum? So what this table represents is in the first column, we have the skills that we were measuring. And then in the second column, we have the common words and key ideas that were pulled out from the narrative portion of the SREI. And then in the third column, I have listed different civics and action activities or exercises that I use throughout the class to, um, to, to have the kids practice these skills, essentially. Um, and so that's what, what, they're, what I found there. And I bolded some of the key ideas there, just in case we have educators or adolescent practitioners, if you guys wanted to pull any of that um, information for your own ideas. Um, I'll focus on the same three skills here that I focused on in the previous graph, just um, highlighting the key, the key I ideas. As one common explanation for why participants appear with communication improved, they thought their communication improved was through interviewing specific experts in the field. Um, and so what the assignment was is they were required to generate questions, so they could generate them with a group with that in the classroom, but then they actually had to go out and find an expert in the field that they were doing research on and hold that what was oftentimes a cold interview. They didn't know the person. We networked and we found somebody that was working in their field, but they didn't necessarily know them. Um, and they they admitted that it was a difficult task and it was embarrassing and so on and so forth. And they were extremely vulnerable. The joy and the pride that, and inspiration they took from those phone calls or from those Zoom calls at the time um, was enough for them to realize that their communication was improving and enough for them for, or enough for them to realize that although it was hard, it was also something that they really benefited from. Um, keywords that came forward in the narrative explanation for critical thinking down here were patterns, solve or solutions, and then execute. And an assignment I in the course that I connected to this and that want to highlight is this project proposal. So again, seniors in high school had to write a seven part project proposal for a project that they needed to create and, and dream up of essentially. And in this project proposal, some of those sections included their timeline or their research or essential research questions and things like that. So again, looking for patterns that they were interested in, as well as then being able to execute something that was that a lot of them hadn't ever created before, and um, and they they successfully did that, and they needed to then use their cognitive ability to create 
a fluid project proposal that I could follow or their mentor could follow or different people like that. Um, the final piece of research that I want to address is the skill of invention here at the bottom. And some of the key ideas there were innovate and shift. I really thought this idea of shifting was really interesting because they, they realized the need for flexibility in a project design as well as working with other people. Um, and so with that invention, they, I had them do something called a tuning protocol. And the tuning protocol was an opportunity for them right at the beginning of their project where they had to present their idea to their classmates and myself and um, other adults that we had in the room. And they, this was, this is part of a design think a design process, design, design model process where you present an idea and then you have an opportunity for the audience to ask some deliberate questions and then ask some thoughtful questions and then the audience actually discusses it. And so because they were exposed to this vulnerability right from the onset, they also had a community of support around them that they knew that they could go to when they had to have different iterations of their project. So it empowered this idea of invention for them, which I think then carried through the rest of the course of civics in action. The last one that I'll talk about um, is the principles. Which of the five principles of Allah do these experiences tie to? And what I was realizing in my analysis of this is that the five principles actually tie to all of them. And I think that's where my next research will probably go is because the, I can, and, that, and that's, that's the purpose of Allah is being able to create an assignment, create a task, create a program that adolescents are experiencing, but making sure the different five principles are actually having that, um, the, they're tying into the, the principles. Um, and so what I did for the example on this slide was I used the, in the community expert interview. And then in the overlay of this, I, I analyzed that they were, the students had to create a space for the interview to occur. And that included whether or not it was on Zoom, but they needed to hold that space. They needed to be comfortable in who they were to actually lead the interview because the community expert wasn't the one leading the conversation at that point and kind of dictating how things were gonna go. Um, and then they also obviously had that skill development and communication. And then the interdisciplinary collaboration pathway was, um, was ensuring that they could connect with different experts in the field. And then also realizing that it wasn't just limited to one type of expert. Maybe it was, um, maybe it was a city planner, maybe it was somebody at school who was gonna help support them or, or somebody who was gonna give them guidance. And so that was that interdisciplinary collaboration and helping them kind of expand their, their own mindset of the different experts that they could speak to. And then innate wisdom was obviously just empowering them to speak from their own voice and ask questions that were important to them that then also tied back to their research. And then the cultural responsibility piece for this one is I was able to, um, to look at it as though and position it to my students to say, you also need to do this in a way that can benefit the, the person you're talking to. Like, how can this actually return back to the community expert and, and kind of what is the giveaway that give back that you can give to them while you're having this, um, having the conversation with them. So those were the findings. Um, and my further analysis, if you can, the, this wheel I've taken now, Allah is the center, the circle in the center, and then the skills that I assessed on the SREI are the ones on the outside. And if you can actually imagine it as a wheel, like you can move the outside circle around, because I'm a strong believer that this, this connection, this piece of not just leaving collaboration and skill development, but actually looking at collaboration in, um, in cultural responsibility and how can we make it, a, how can we make people accountable for um, developing schools, developing after school programs where we have adolescent programming? How can we ensure that we're collaborating with a wider population or providing opportunities for self-direction? Um, so my analysis is um, principles of Allah were embedded throughout activities in the course. Um, the skills measured by the tool can be matched with any of the principles. And then the skills could also be interchanged with, um, 
with with other skills. So we don't necessarily need to stick, stick to those seven skills on the outside. If you're doing a different type of program, you could use different skills on the external, external circle as well. And then these are a couple of questions I'd love to pose to the group. And then I'll of course open it up for other questions, but where do you feel like these practices are already happening? And then how are these principles embedded in youth programming that you're aware of today? So those are just questions that I, I was kind of looking forward to asking the group just so that I can take my research further and possibly connect with groups that are already doing work like this. All right, is that it, Leslie? That is, yep. Congratulations on a wonderful Thank presentation. You. Thank um, you. It's it's quite obvious how deeply engaged you are in this work and um, completely engaged. <laughs> and also uh, um, the theoretical underpinnings of what you're doing are, are very highly developed. So congratulations for that. Thank you. Um, a simple question for me to start with. Uh, is ALA your thing or is it a, a term in the field? No, it's my thing. Your thing. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Um, it can well, be others thing too. I'm happy to share. <laughs> <laughs> happy to have people use it. <laughs> but ALA is your creation, obviously. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, okay. Well, then that that cleared up one question that I had. <laughs> I'll save my other question for later. Let's see if there's uh, so, uh, others in the audience. Please unmute yourself and and go ahead and ask or comment. Catherine, you have your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I'm curious um, if you've linked at all with people who are doing restorative justice in the, in that at that level with adolescents. I haven't. I started linking it with um, some different camps and things like that in Colorado, um, but restorative justice is definitely a piece that is near and dear to my heart. So that's a great place. Um, that's a great place to connect with. Yeah, thank you. We're just going to say thank you for your work and research and education. Uh, I also did focus on 21st century learning and, and social emotional learning. And uh, thinking about maybe your question posed at the end, if um, you're looking into remedial programs or bridge support programs that guide students as a cohort to uh, towards retention or overall. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Somebody else had a hand up, I think. Yeah, I, 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 have a, I had a question um, that I think about a lot, which is the, the substance of what you're talking about seems to benefit, if not require, some capacity for systems thinking. Yeah. And... You know, I, I I wonder about just the the level of maturity, ego development, et cetera, um, with adolescents. Like, do they have the capacity? And if they don't, how do you get around that seemingly essential need for to to to, to see what they're working on in this bigger picture and how it all relates to to each other yeah is that a question yes <laughs> yeah um great question because i have worked with all sorts of different adolescents in my in my tenure as an educator and practitioner um and i think it's that piece of the facilitation and the guide for the practitioner and like in somebody who is is trained in Allah is also there. It's kind of like what I feel like fielding does for us too, is like our, our dissertation chairs, like they're there for us to make sure that we fail, we fail first early, right? And then we continue to build on that rather than failing right at the end or like not making the cut right at the end. But we have these, these um these opportunities early on to to demonstrate that they're ready for the next level, so to speak. Um, but I agree that it's definitely a systems change perspective and um, and in different work. So 
the the school was one project and I felt like that was a more controlled environment but in in my other like 20 hours of day. Um, I also lead a program fire is lit and we have a whole bunch of teens that are all over the board. And sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, we're putting them up to talk to different people, um, to talk to legislators and to talk to policymakers. And I think sometimes I wanna run and hide, but then I think it also is that accomplishment of they are still teenagers. So we do need to give them that space to, to fail forward in some ways. I think like Carol Dweck might say it as like, yeah, they're gonna fail, but we're gonna get up and do it again. So uh, um, more directly, yeah. do you believe that these adolescents have the capacity to learn systems thinking in, in somewhat contradiction to the develop, you know, adult developmental models that would say, you know, you have to be at a, stage four for that, which of course the yeah. adolescents aren't. So I'm just wondering if what you, your experience, because you're so deep into this, whether yeah. that, which of those is true? So I, th I think, I, th I know I have worked with adolescents that are ready for that and that understand it when they have something to attach the systems to. So for instance, when I was working at this charter school in Denver, we could talk about redlining and we could talk about voting districts in our civics class and they could they could see that the system of oppression happening with, with voting and voting rights and different things like that because we could hang it on something and then they could then apply it outward to things that were a little bit more abstract. Working with the teens here in St. Croix, where I'm based right now, as I'm compiling this and still working with some teens, I don't know if their adolescent mind is ready for that type of systems analysis. So I think it would be a case, my experience would be it's more of a case by case. Um, and then I would even layer on top of that, the exposure to technology and what that's doing to our adolescent brains. We're gonna have a whole nother conundrum it's pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, great questions. Good conversation. <laughs> yeah, let um, me just follow up on that topic a little bit. Uh, what is the what are the age boundaries for adolescents? So my work looks at fourteen to twenty one. So it's a pretty wide gap as well. And twenty one is when neuroscientists are starting to say like the brain has fully like fully formed and the regions are fully developed and things like that so i thought it was actually older than that but and i guess the the adjunct to my question is um uh i mean your model of leadership is so rich <laughs> um multi-dimensional it seems like it would be useful for any for someone at any stage of human development a colleague has said that to me. She said, I've actually used that in some of my meetings. Like, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, other comments and questions? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I have a fully formed thought yet, Leslie, but it's so <laughs> exciting. I can hardly sit beside myself. Uh, oh. and, and I hope we can connect. Um, I'm, I'm in Houston and we, we're working with ninth graders in a parochial school uh, that the demographics are quite similar to what you just showed, okay. um, even even um, less white students and more black and brown students. And okay. we're talking with them about um, racial conditioning. And yes. for, for the whole spring semester, um, once a week, and we've been, we've, and they're ninth graders. And we've been doing this in other places, in other parochial schools in Houston uh, with uh, juniors and seniors. And, and you're giving vocabulary to what, we've been thinking about and didn't have someone with your expertise on the team. So there's a, there's a, somewhere, there's an opportunity for an invitation for, for you to talk more with us to okay. possibly take this, your work into their school in the future. So I really hope we can connect. Yeah. I just put some, I put my contact information in the chat. So definitely record it or put yours in the chat too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question, uh, Leslie, in regards to the brain. I love yeah. everything oh. is about the brain. Um, and you're talking about integrating right and left uh, brain, having novel experiences to grow new neural pathways. And I'm just wondering, number one, on your technique. Number two, 
in terms of fully integration, I believe Charles uh, is right about it being much later than the early 20. I think it's much, much later, 28, 29, um, in terms of the brain coming into its own. We mm -hmm. have also a layer of the stress hormones locking down creativity and not uh, enabling adults with fully developed brains to be able to be creative, think outside the box, let alone uh, adolescents that are dealing with such shifting uh, hormonal uh, <laughs> uh, so how do you work with that? How do you uh, help uh, these fabulous um, adolescents <laughs> to sit down and actually engage in self-reflection? Do you teach them breath work, meditation? Uh, what's, what's the technique and the yeah. pathway toward that? Yeah, so it's a combination of that. We actually did do breath work because they also had to do presentations. So it was that piece of they were scared to get up and, and talk, whether or not it was 20 people or one person. Um, we also did a lot of site visits and field trips. I felt like that was one thing. And we walked to them or we had to take the bus to them. It wasn't like, okay, we're going to move from the classroom to the bus to the location. It was, all right, we're going to move from the classroom to the street to the bus. Like It was multi-step. And so they had to engage with the process. And again, de like developing those neural pathways that were going to get them from point A to point Z, so to speak. And so those were some, and sometimes we walked to those. We also did um, what I call walkabouts, where we would just take walks around the school. And then they would have questions that they would have to ask and have a conversation with with a partner they'd have to then like switch partners and so it was that integration of like the physiological experience so they could hopefully get into their parasympathetic mode and be vulnerable to the learning that was happening and then we they had what I felt like was the space and the patience to come back in the classroom and have me give them guidance about all right here's how, here are five steps I'm delivering a presentation or something like that so it was coupled with breath work. I'll be honest, it was a little bit sneaky. It wasn't like, okay, we're gonna breathe in and out. It was like the box breath and giving them those visual techniques that an adolescent mind is gonna need rather than we're diving right into meditation, friends. <laughs> um, so just kind of recognizing where they were and then, and then making it in excerpts of eight or nine minutes and then changing the field after that so that they could have the space to integrate it in the individual being that they were, knowing that my 20 to 30 students in the classroom were going to have different experiences to whatever I was going to expose them to. Wonderful. I love your approach to uh, working with these young adults. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any final questions or comments? I don't know if we have addressed, Leslie, your questions. I got I got some ideas for sure. <laughs> uh, there uh, there is a question in the chat asking if you have published any of this work yet. I'm working on that. Like it's part of the reason why I'm in the in I'm not in Denver right now is so I can put all this together. So good. Well, we we know that it needs to get published. It's it's, <laughs> so, it's so important and such high quality. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, any other? Let's see. Uh, there may be. A, can you see the chat, Leslie? I can. Yep, sure can. Just taking notes from it. <laughs> okay. Um, I, my... Okay, perfect. All right. Well, if no final um, comments, then we thank you again for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, everybody. And Catherine, I see you. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Um... I think I'm going to try again to share my screen. And if I have the same problem, maybe we can do plan B where I turn off my screen share and you show my slides, Charles, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. So let's try plan A. I'll share my screen. You know, I think that's going to be good enough. Can you see my? Um, Here we go. We've got you. And 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 not my notes, just the slides. Nope, nope just the slides. Oh yay! <laughs> All right, we did it. Thanks everybody for being so uh, patient.
patient with uh, the technology. Um, and I, I hope actually my presentation will help people think about um, publication because that's kind of what I'm going to uh, focus on in my talk. So I appreciate the opportunity to discuss uh, my project. I'm working on comparing two people who developed theories of human behavior as they apply to work systems. Neither of the theorists set up set out to be to develop theories, uh, but both were uh, were compelled to create frameworks based on what they observed. So I'll go into more detail in the presentation, but I just wanted to give an outline here of my initial goal, which was to publish an academic article about Bowen theory, as uh, Charles mentioned. However, that goal shifted a bit in the process. So I'll talk about um, what inspired me, the process I used, the product I generated, and the current uh, status of the project. So for my dissertation research at Fielding, uh, which I completed in 2012, I created a practice model for using Bowen theory, which is a family therapy framework. I had been studying and using it for, uh, in organization development work uh, myself before I, I wrote about it. I, I looked at uh, other practitioners who were using the theory. I published my dissertation and a practice-oriented article that I derived from it um, on academia.edu. Among the people who read the material and contacted me about it were two academic researchers who wanted more current academic theoretical material on Bowen theory. For various reasons, and I, I'd written about that in the past, the study of Bowen theory has been isolated from the academic mainstream within the Bowen centers that, uh, that Murray Bowen, the, the person who developed the theory, set up and it's affiliated network nodes. It's not really mainstreamed in academia in um, even in even really in family uh, therapy. But the research that's happening is really focused more on family therapy practice. So the academic theoretical material on work systems just doesn't doesn't exist. So there was a meeting in Sweden this past summer. It was uh, the third international conference on Bowen theory. It's very interesting to see how a Bowen theory has been taken up in other countries besides the US, particularly China, Australia, and there's this incredibly active node in Swedish, in Swedish Lapland of all places. So it's, it's quite interesting to see that. And I presented a paper there on uh, various ideas for moving Bowen theory uh, into the mainstream, including the idea for a paper. But I wasn't really sure how to proceed because I retired and I no longer had academic affiliation. So the when the fellowship idea came up, I was um, really, uh, really inspired uh, by the idea that I could get access to the to the library material and um, have the academic affiliation that I thought would be important. So once I was awarded the fellowship, I considered, first of all, I looked at, at uh, since my focus was on publishing an academic article, I focused on selecting a journal for submission. And I, and I selected systems, a journal that covers a variety of systems theories rather than a practice-oriented organization development journal, since I'd already kind of done that. Uh, because Bowen theory is so uh, underrepresented in the literature, I decided, prompted by a, a fielding colleague, to compare and contrast Bowen theory with another natural systems theory of human behavior that pertains to work systems. I looked at Derek and Lara Cabrera's framework, but instead I selected Barry Oshry's systems theory. The Cabrera's uh, orientation is, is a more generalized rule-based approach to a variety of complex adaptive systems, whereas both Bowen theory and uh, Bowen as a person and Oshry uh, as a person focused specifically on, on human behavior. 
So my first step was a literature review. Uh, and um, I was able to confirm what I suspected that there wasn't much academic literature on either theory. Ashri has written quite a few popular books on his theory. And in finally in 2020, he wrote an academic uh, article in, uh, in the Academy of Management uh, journal, but otherwise there, there wasn't much. Catherine Rakow, uh, who was a retired social worker and lifelong student of Bowen theory had just come out with a book about the development of Bowen's thinking that relied on the archive of his papers at the National Library of Medicine, History of Medicine Division, where his family <clears throat> has donated his papers and also the Bowen Center has donated his, his papers. There's it's a copious amount of uh, material. Uh, the collection is unprocessed, which means that um, it has had some processing in order to be able to put it in boxes and folders, but it's not indexed or you can't like find it in a Google search. So um, it's really a little difficult to navigate around. And um, I relied on Catherine Rakow's work. She has spent uh, decades in this material and her reference, the references in her book were my key uh, to the archival material. So I spent a couple of days uh, there at the National Library of Medicine. And uh, I found some gray material, interview transcripts and so forth that supplemented older published material. And um, both Bowen and Ashri also used video as, a, as an outlet for communicating their ideas. So, Watching videos of both theorists was also a good way for me to gather uh, material information. If you want to know more about the uh, the research project for the or the research process for the archives, that's a, another whole story that Charles is somewhat acquainted with. Um, I'd be happy to go into that in more detail in the Q and A. Oh, also, if people want to put questions in the chat as well as you know, at the end we can do the the hand waving part that's that's one uh, good way to ask your questions if you if you're thinking of some as we go along so my process um, i had once i've compiled the information about each theory i drafted a paper and i used apa format when i was looking at journals to submit to I also considered the format because I wasn't at this time in my life going to learn Chicago style. That wasn't happening. <laughs> so uh, Systems has its own format, but they the publisher accepts papers in any accepted format as long as the author is consistent. So once I finished the draft, I sent it to a few friends, one of my fielding colleagues, the one who had suggested the compare and contrast idea, and a couple of my neighbors who are retired journalists. They uh, did a great job of uh, providing editorial comments and I made their uh, suggested changes and submitted it to the journal, uh, which I was surprised actually to find they um, made the initial acceptance right away got it ready to send out for, for peer review. And that's even happened faster than I expected. I got uh, comments from two reviewers earlier this week and a note from the editor that one additional reviewer would send, send comments soon. They asked for then a 10 day turnaround on the suggested changes. I thought the feedback was constructive. Both of the reviewers so far suggested adding tables to, clarif to clarify the comparison uh, that I'd made in text. Um, when I submitted the article, they requested the names and contact information for five reviewers. I could submit the names of people I, I know as long as they were not fielding affiliated. I could also select from their editorial board, which I did. I submitted six suggestions and I'm not sure how they decided which ones to choose. And I, I don't know who the two uh, reviewers who, who gave me comments are. 
if I if it looks like I'm moving around, it's because I'm petting one of my dogs to keep her from barking. So a bit more information about the publisher. This is a little bit of a an aside, uh, but I think because I'm a, a retired librarian um, as well as an organization development consultant, these issues are ones I think about and want to share with you if you're thinking about preparing material of your own for publication. Uh, the publisher is called MDPI and um, it's an open access publisher and they focus on scientific journals. The publisher is based in Switzerland, but they have offices around the world. They publish almost 400 different titles. Because my, goal, my own goal was to give greater exposure to these two underrepresented theorists, uh, I wanted to find an open access journal and um, one that emphasized theory rather than practice. So open access journals, for those of you who might not know, are not behind paywalls. I believe that the reason, uh, one reason why I got attention from these two uh, researchers who contacted me was because I had published my dissertation and the article on academia.edu as well as ProQuest, uh, which people I think don't always easily uh, find in open internet searches. So, um, and, and I have a commitment to open access principles. So, uh, in the case of M MDPI, the material is made openly accessible by charging a publishing fee rather than a subscription price for libraries and individuals. And some institutions are now supporting faculty publishing in open access journals by paying those fees. Uh, Fielding doesn't yet have such a program according uh, to the information that Charles and uh, Charles helped me gather. Uh, but Abby Ray, who's the Fielding librarian, uh, explained that Fielding does have an arrangement with Wiley uh, to waive open access fees when publishing open access with them. So if people are thinking about uh, about outlets, that's that, that's an idea. Um, I think she also was going to research whether that waiver would apply to uh, fellows as well as uh, faculty and students. This is, um, I think this is an important topic that people should be aware of, but what's even more important is copyright awareness. Uh, when selecting an outlet for publication, make sure you, you, um, hold, you retain some of your rights, at least some of your rights. Uh, some publishers want you to assign all your rights to them. And if you do that, you can't even publish your paper on your own website without violate, violating copyright. So when you're when you're signing uh, agreements with publishers, make sure you pay attention to that. So sorry for the diatribe. <laughs> so um, I had already extracted some of the comparison data and put it into semi tabular form for this uh, presentation. So I think I'll rely on this when I'm adding tabular information to the paper. You'll see that the two theorists came from different fields, uh, psychiatry and business education, and they made their observations in different types of environments. Bowen began his work somewhat earlier than Ashri. Uh, Bowen died in the late 80s and Ashri is still uh, alive and kicking at the age of 90. He still con continues to be an active advisor to the consulting group he and his wife founded. Bowen observed families and extrapolated from his observations of family groups, whereas Ashri observed members of work groups in a laboratory setting. As I mentioned earlier, neither uh, theorist set out to generate a theory. Bowen wanted to figure out a treatment for schizophrenia, and Ashri wanted to provide uh, experiential education for business students. But in the process of doing their work, each came to the realization that the patterns they observed were in the system rather than in the individual. And they were motivated to record their observations as theoretical frameworks. 
Despite the differences in their backgrounds, Bowen and Ashri used a similar framework and approach. They wanted to rely on, uh, on evolutionary theory uh, to record their observations about human behavior. A natural systems framework means following the principles of evolutionary theory, which is slightly different from the technique of building a mathematical model of complex adaptive systems, which you'll also see, I think, in, the, in some literature relating to uh, systems in, in work groups. But, but those broader mathematical models also look at things like uh, modeling traffic patterns or other natural systems uh, behavior like fish, the way fish swim in schools. Uh, both Bowen and Oshry believe that by becoming aware of the natural instinctive processes driving human behavior, people could shift their positions and work groups could improve their functioning. So the differences in what they derived as a result of their observations were, uh, Bowen saw the entire work group engaged in an overall emotional process driven by anxiety or stress. Oshry focused on hierarchy that came out of a, uh, an observation that was made during the um, NTL days when people were using T groups. And um, there was a, there was a be belief at that time that the T group process kind of ignored the power dynamics. So the hierarchy kind of came into play as a result of that. He really looked at the tensions that arise between groups because of the fixed positions people uh, get into within each group. He, he called them tops, middles, and bottoms. His language changed a little bit through the development of his theory, but basically it was these three tiers. Bowen uh, posited that when tensions between two people become too great, a third person is brought in or triangled. This pattern can continue through, throughout a work system until the problem lands on a low level scapegoat rather than having been addressed where it belongs at the top. They used uh, different language, the two theorists. Sometimes they used the same term to mean two different things. In Bowen theory, differentiation refers to an individual acting on principle, whereas in Oshry's theory, differentiation is a, is a system response to opportunity or threat. Along with differentiation, Oshry included three other patterns that need to work together for optimal functioning in a work system individuation, integration, and homogenization. Bowen saw the potential for individual leadership within a system to create a shift, whereas Ashri emphasized group action within the system as the mechanism for change. So my, uh, my project status is such that uh, the paper has been accepted by systems, as I mentioned, for peer review. And um, I'm in the process of uh, making the revisions. One of the re reviewers was curious about the number of people and or work groups each theorist had coached. Um, that data, I think, would be hard to find. Um, in fact, although Bowen talked about two exemplar exemplary leaders in one of his teaching videos, it wasn't clear how he knew them. People who were his students during that period of, of his life thought they were probably his clients. To their knowledge, Bowen did not consult to organizations, so he was really extrapolating from what he learned through his observation of family groups. Uh, many of his students have gone on to apply his theory uh, to work systems, however. Uh, let's see, the paper I wrote uh, include suggestions for future work as listed here. Uh, one example of a presenting problem that would be interesting to test came from Ashri. A participant in one of his workshops discovered that he was torn in the middle position in his workplace. He decided to get out of the middle position by organizing a meeting between the tops and the bottoms in his, in his organization. The meeting went well, but his boss told him not to try that again. Ashri didn't divulge the outcome for this person, uh, but Bowen theory would suggest that the person should have expected and prepared for a change back action. Systems don't necessarily embrace or appreciate uh, 
instigation of change. Uh, so the question remains, in Bowen theory, uh, he thought a solid contract ag agreement between the leader and the subordinate makes for a functional relationship. So would the person in the middle ever be able to renegotiate the contract with this boss? Or would they need to find a different job? A consultant using Bowen theory might coach the leader and the subordinate, where a consultant using Oshry's theory might involve a larger group. I hope the paper offers the opportunity for researchers like the people who contacted me to experiment with using both one or both of these theories in their work. I think both theories have something to offer in helping work groups improve their functioning. So I welcome your questions or comments and I appreciate, again, I appreciate your attention and opportunity to share my uh, project with you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, we're open for questions and comments. And I, I wanna start with a question <clears throat> that may seem, um, I don't know, too specific, but um, it's called Bowen theory rather than Bowen's theory, apostrophe S. Yeah, the other one is Oshre's theory, apostrophe S. Why is it called Bowen theory? This may seem like an obscure question rather than, you know, the ABC theory or a systems theory of work or something like that. Yeah, I think it would probably be better if it had a different name, <laughs> but Bowen. It doesn't what it is. Yeah, Bowen, himself, no, it doesn't at all. And it, um, and it also is the same as a massage therapy theory or something else that is named for a person. So oh. he was the one who, um, Bowen himself was the one who decided to name it for himself. And I think he, you know, kind of went through a series of questions about whether that was a good idea or not. I think that that to me, I think, gets to the root of why it hasn't, you know, one of one of the reasons why it hasn't um, enjoyed a wider um, understanding. Yeah. Not only did he name it for himself, he also he was affiliated with Georgetown University for a while. He went from Menninger to the National Institute of Mental Health and then to Georgetown University. During the time he was at Georgetown, he was teaching. It was in the medical school, so it's not the same as teaching in a, an academic discipline where you have graduate students who are generating work, but still you have the opportunity to convey your ideas to other people but he I don't know got upset or had a difference of opinion with with someone at Georgetown and divorced from <laughs> from Georgetown started his own center and it, it um, unfortunately I think as a result has isolated itself in almost kind of a cultish way and that's part of part of what needs to be overcome, in my opinion. Well, you're doing you're doing good librarian work by uh, unearthing this uh, relatively unknown. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Other questions. And, and Ashri, I I just for my paper for the purpose of my paper, and somewhat parallel structure um, named it that way because it doesn't have a name. Uh, he he called it seeing systems in one of his books, but that's not really a, the name of a theory. It, it you know I, I struggled a little bit with what to call it. Power and power and love, you know, they're different ways it's referred to. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have a question for Catherine? Hey. Yeah, thank, thank you for taking the time about the publication. I, I'm sure I'm not the only one in this group who's really interested in how, you know, to, to navigate that system. And by the way, just you know, aside, I, I would love for us, you know, to, to have to, to, to maybe find a way for us to learn together. Um, and, and so we're not all learning on our own uh, to navigate that, that process. So I don't know. Charles, if that's something you can coordinate for us, I'm I've been feeling a little um, on my own in that in that regard. 
I just had, a, you know, just a very specific question, Catherine, about the publishing, taking your dissertation and putting it on Academia Edu. And I was wondering if we are permitted to do that because it's published on ProQuest, even though we can, like I, I like you, have paid ProQuest the extra money that so that it can be open access on ProQuest. But are we permitted under that? The, the, the copyright their 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 rights for us because i because i think like you it's great to get it out there so other people will will will, will get exposed to it yes it's as my as i understand it having read the agreement um it's a non-exclusive they have the non-exclusive publication rights so hmm. so yeah um we can put it wherever we want i think great thank you I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but that's my understanding. But no one's given you a hard time so far, right? I haven't been sued. <laughs> it's a it's an obscure theory no one has noticed. These two people, <laughs> just two people. <laughs> Lisa has a question. Hi, yes, thanks so much for your work and commitment to open access too. I also have a logistical question on, on the publishing. So, um, that may include so there's academia edu and research gate as well so i assume they probably had the same maybe exclusive access publishing rights um that we can publish on there if we want to but also thinking about um the reviewer process you mentioned for the journals so um they have to be non-feeling affiliated can they be affiliated with any other institution you attended or you just select from their board or well, i'm curious to learn more about that process yeah, that's um, that's a good question. So I ended up um, I selected a fielding colleague who is no longer she's not a student anymore. She teaches at at other institutions, so I thought that was okay. Um, I selected a person who wrote a practice oriented article about Ashri's theory, and I I didn't know her, but I uh, I got a hold of her and asked her permission to do that. And then I looked through their, they have a pretty large editorial board. So I looked through their, um, the members of the board and suggested people who were interested in systems theories and uh, selected three of three of them. Does that help? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And there's some uh, comments in the chat from Elena and others about publishing, including the Fielding uh, Journal, just for your information. Uh, anybody else have a hand up? All right, well, Catherine, thank you again very much. And um, keep us posted. We're, we'll keep you posted there. <laughs> Keep everybody posted about the success of this publication. Thank you. Um, well, just a couple of closing comments. First of all, thank you everyone for sticking with us on Friday. Appreciate it a lot. Um, and I wanna thank Elena, especially for her support from with me and this group today. Thank you, Elena. I know you have a million things on your plate <laughs> and we will um, be, posting on the alumni site with Elena's help um, a recording of this uh, session as well as uh, the PowerPoints, uh, the, pre you know, the, the, the decks that everybody produced, so you can have those um, and make use of them. Um, and I do take seriously the suggestion of maybe having a session sometime in the near future about the whole publication process. It's got many facets to it. It's um, There are many different practices with different journals, and, and um, perhaps we could, um, if any of you are interested, let me know. I'll, I'll Maybe I'll put out a call to all the fellows um, about about the uh, about this topic, and as you know, we have a book uh, that's just been published on leadership. Um, all the chapters uh, being authored by ISI fellows. So, um, and let me just look in chat. Elena, will this and other ISI be published on the YouTube channel? Uh, Elena, can you answer that question? Uh, yes, uh, 
Yes, uh, we will publish it on the YouTube channel and the previous presentation uh, from January session is already on the YouTube channel. Great. And I was just putting the links in the chat uh, for the videos with uh, Jean-Pierre Sbaut, who is the director of Fielding University Press and the author of 28 books. So uh, he has a, a series of four uh, webinars from inverting your dissertation into research uh, to publishing a scholarly article to publishing a book with traditional publishers as well as um, you know virtual different virtual spaces. So that's all available on Fielding's um, YouTube channel. And when you go in there, you can just put in search like publish or it's about and it will show up. And of course, um, with, uh, if Dr. McClintock wants to host um, another session for ISI and bring Dr. Spock, she's always available. We have funding for two alum publications per year through Fielding University Press. So if you were to uh, interested, it's not memoir, it's research. So if you wanted interested in publishing your research um, through Fielding University Press, you, you need to apply there. Um, there are some guidelines. I don't have them handy, but you can just uh, contact alumni relations uh, and, you know, somebody will respond. Will not respond next week because Hillary and I are out of the office, but will respond the following week. Um, so you can you can just write to alumni relations at fielding.edu. Thank you very much, Elena, for that information. And thank you all very much, and uh, I wish you all well, and we'll see you in the sometime in the near future. So bye-bye.